This video is about a special class of transformations used in complex analysis called fractional linear transformations and the natural space that they operate on called CP1 or the complex projective line. A fractional linear transformation is a function of, of this form. So f of z equals az plus b over cz plus d, where z is taken to be a complex number. I'm going to be a little vague about the domain right now, but it's clear that you can't plug in every complex number if c is non-zero. In any case, a, b, c, and d are complex numbers, and we have the added restriction that a, d minus b, c is non-zero. And the reason we have this is, well, that makes this matrix a, b, c, d invertible, and so a, b is not a multiple of c, d. And the reason we want to avoid that is that if, if a, b were a multiple of c, d, then f would reduce to a constant. So this, um, this guarantees that f is non-constant. I should also mention that fractional linear transformations are also called Mobius transformations, or you can switch linear and fractional, and it's the same thing, linear fractional or fractional linear. Let's go through some important examples of fractional linear transformations. The first group are just the translations. So for every z, you map z to z plus b, where b is a fixed complex number. You're just shifting things by this complex number. Next, we have multiplications, which fit under FLTs. So we map z to az, where a is non-zero in order to make it non-constant. And we also have inversion, which fits under the previous setup because we can write this as 0z plus 1 over 1z plus 0. Notice here that we do have to restrict the domain to be uh, non-zero z's. And then finally, a last example is something called the Cayley transform. And this is an important map. Here is its formula. It maps the unit disk onto the upper half plane. So the unit disk is all uh, points in the complex plane with modulus less than 1. And it maps this onto the upper half plane, which is all points in C with imaginary part positive. And this can be quite useful for transferring any question on the disk to the upper half plane or vice versa via the Cayley transforms inverse. I also want to point out that later we're going to show that every FLT is a composition of these first three, translations, multiplications, and inversions. Here's a, a page which shows, in some sense, what inversion does geometrically. And this will be a preview for some things we'll learn later. Namely, we'll learn that all FLTs turn lines either to circles or lines, and they turn circles into circles or lines. So we'll notice that inversion turns these lines over here into either a line or a circle. So the line going through the origin right here gets mapped to this line, while these other lines parallel to it get mapped to various circles. Just for fun, I thought I'd illustrate a little bit of how the Cayley transform works. As I said before, it sends the unit disk to the upper half plane, and you can sort of see that from this picture. The unit circle here gets sent to the real line. This circle inside it gets sent to the circle in the upper half plane, and this circle here gets sent here. And if you zoomed in further and further to the origin, you'd get circles zooming in on the point i. 
Whereas if you take one of these circles around the unit disk, these get mapped to circles in the lower half plane. And the bigger the circle you take, the more you actually zoom in on the point minus i. So if I were to take an even bigger circle out here, it would sit inside here, and they keep going in further and further. So the Cayley transform turns these concentric disks into uh, one family of circles that zooms in on i and another family that zooms in on minus i. One thing to notice is that the bigger and bigger circles, which you could think of as heading to infinity, they map to the point, uh, they tend to minus i, whereas zero maps to i. If we talk about FLTs using the complex numbers as their domain, we run into various difficulties because we don't want the denominator to be zero. It turns out to, to make the most sense to expand our domain to what's called CP1 or the complex projective line. We say line because we have one complex dimension. And this consists of ordered pairs Z1, Z2, which are not 0, 0, under an equivalence relation. So I'll use these square brackets to indicate points under this equivalence relation, where uh, z1, z2 is equivalent to w1, w2 if this ordered pair, z1, z2, is a multiple of w1, w2. And this is an equivalence relation because you can divide by the lambda. Now, this is supposed to expand c to a larger set because I can map any z to z1. And so any point of the form z1, z2, where z2 is non-zero, can be converted to a point of this form by factoring out the z2. On the other hand, cp1 is bigger because c does not map to any points with zero in the second component. And so this is what we'll call the point at infinity. So CP1 can really be identified with C union, some extra point C infinity. And now we'll see that it makes the most sense to define FLTs on CP1, and then our problems with domains and ranges go away.